Okay, great. Thank you very much, Mirsa. Um, so I'm going to give a summary of some work that I started to do uh, this sprint with uh, Miroslaw and Wilhelm and some colleagues uh, from Ericsson. So we were looking at modeling and taxonomy for data anomaly analysis. Uh, so first, what do we mean by data anomalies? So, I mean, basically, this is sort of what you think it is. I think it's something that most people are pretty familiar with, but it's a period of data which breaks a previously observed pattern. So if you have sort of, you know, data that, that follows a pattern that you understand, then suddenly you have the data doing something kind of strange or unusual, like spiking or dropping, depending on what you're measuring. So another way to describe it could be a notably unusual data pattern. And this could be a network data, customer data, whatever sort of data you collect. Uh, so examples, <clears throat> excuse me, so unusual spikes, dips, and things like network traffic, number of users, certain types of requests, uh, these are just some examples. And so in this project, uh, our colleagues are detecting these data anomalies using machine learning algorithms, um, but we're not talking too much about the kind of AI aspect here. So we're kind of starting with the anomalies that have been detected and then trying to do some sort of deeper analysis. So although machine learning is really uh, powerful for detecting the anomalies, it, it's still a little bit limited in telling you why these anomalies occur. So it doesn't necessarily give you a reason or the uh, understanding behind the anomalies. So for now, it more or less just kind of detects it and clusters it using attributes which may or may not be very meaningful in the domain. So we're trying to kind of add some meaning on top of these results. So one just simple example, not from the software center, but just grabbing something from Wikipedia. So here you can see historical climate data uh, and you can, you know, looking at data like that, you can pick out some anomalies. So here we have a kind of a strange period of years where the, the temperature rose and then there's another strange period of years where the temperature dropped. And of course, what you want to do is not just notice this is there, but try and understand why. And so we're, we're kind of really focusing on the why for data anomalies. So our project goals are to, like I said, understand anomalies. So what are the key attributes? When we talk about an, an anomaly, what do we want to know about the anomaly? What are the important kind of uh, sort of anomaly metadata that we want to collect? Uh, and what are what attributes are important and why? And can we classify these anomaly types? So can we classify them maybe into, you know, different reasons why they happened or, or other sort of meaningful classifications in the domain? And what we're really aiming towards are to uh, improve the speed and correctness of anomaly detection, find common solutions, find missing anomalies in new areas for detection, understand the root causes of anomalies with respect to stakeholders, recommending actions for stakeholders. So you can say, you know, in this past anomaly, this fixed it. And this new anomaly has a similar classification, so perhaps the old uh, fix will fix this too. Or develop a, a general method for working with data anomalies. So I think these are some good goals and we're making some progress here, but we're still in some you know, relatively early stages, uh, having just started this sprint. So just to summarize some of our possible use cases, so quickly classify new anomalies, recognize new anomalies similar to previous, suggest root causes for new anomalies, predict unseen anomalies, which could happen, or suggest fixes for anomalies based on past data. So this is what we're aiming towards. So what we've actually done so far is we worked with uh, one of the groups within Ericsson. Uh, we had a number of different meetings and workshops with them, uh, looking at uh, several of their example anomalies of different types uh, and tried to discuss like what sort of attributes and metadata for these anomalies are really important and how do we capture these. Uh, so my background, uh, so I probably didn't say, but I'm in the software engineering department at Chalmers and GU, and I, I'm by uh, background a requirements engineer, and especially I've worked a lot in requirements modeling. So uh, where I came in was to try and uh, model these anomalies and model kind of the data attributes for the anomalies and model the motivations for these anomalies, and then from that kind of work towards a method to understand these in a more general way. So we created class diagrams and goal diagrams, and I'll show you examples of this later for uh, kind of specific instances and also kind of meta models or general descriptions. And then we began to draft a schema for a database of this anomaly meta information. And then offline, uh, I created a very initial taxonomy of anomalies based on the examples we'd looked at so far. And we also created a method for anomaly analysis with models, <clears throat> excuse me, to try and describe kind of in a more abstract way the process we went through to, through to get these models for this particular team with the idea that we can repeat this process for other teams and for other companies, of course. So just a very brief uh, overview of modeling. So of course, a lot of you have seen models before, but I wanted to mention that you can think about models in four different types. There's sort of static, things like class diagrams, and ER diagram that really focuses on the what, dynamic models that focus on, you know, process diagrams, BPMN, things like that. 
And then there's something called intentional, which I've worked in for, for many years, kind of focusing on the why. So this is sort of motivation type diagrams. And then social, so things like social network analysis, ecosystem models that really focus on who. So in this project, we focused you know, more or less on these three dimensions. So we didn't really get into timing or processes, but we tried to understand the attributes and the, the data for the anomalies. And then we tried to look at who and why. So why are these anomalies happening and who does it affect? Um, okay, so here's just an example of sort of the meta model that we came up with looking at a, a number of examples for this team. So I won't get into too much detail here because of course it's a little bit hard to see, but you can see this is sort of a, a typical class diagram. We have an anomaly class and then we started to collect a lot of different attributes for the anomaly that we thought would be interesting. So things like name, event, end users, primary operator, source of data, geographical location, etc. And then over here uh, on the left, we have, uh, you know, it's, it's attached to nodes and pools and customers. So what sort of, you know, data is it attached to? And then we looked at two different kind of high level types of anomalies, these uh, sequential multidimensional anomaly and time series anomaly. And each of these have some other different uh, entities and, and classes that describe it. So uh, metrics and counters or KPIs, uh, ranges, samples, things like that. So this, uh, looking at one particular group, are the sort of attributes that they thought would be uh, interesting and relevant to capture for an anomaly. And we did this sort of iteratively looking at a number of different examples and improving this which e which with each example that we looked at. And so once you have this, you can draw instance. So here's a particular instance. So you just take the model I showed you here and, and fill out as best you can all of the attributes to say, okay, for this particular anomaly, here are the attributes, here are the instances of all the classes, et cetera. And this gives you kind of a snapshot or a picture of a particular anomaly. Uh, and here's another example. So for a different type of anomaly, here we have instances of all the classes with all of the attributes filled out. Uh, and so again, this is a snapshot or picture of this example anomaly. And in doing this, of course, you discuss the anomaly and you come to sort of an agreement on some of these things and have a, a visual overview of the anomaly. So the other thing uh, we did was something called goal models, which looks a bit like this. So this is a general model trying to describe sort of the actors and their goals and their dependencies. Uh, here's some syntax here, uh, generally for these anomalies. So you have the particular company, the software center company on the right, and they want to provide services, run anomaly detection algorithms. They want to have a deeper investigation of the problems and in, in order to improve root cause analysis, et cetera. So here we see some of their goals and tasks inside of that circle. And then on the other side, there's a primary operator or their customer that they work with. And they want to provide reliable service, determine dependencies, prioritize problems, do root cause analysis. And these two actors uh, exchange a number of different reports and data in order to try and work together in order to understand the root cause of the particular data anomaly. And there's also a customer unit at the bottom that, that's uh, attached to the company that's uh, helping with this process. So in this model with all these green elements, these are sort of the elements that, that we thought were common across all of the different anomaly examples that we looked at. And then what we did for specific example anomalies, these same two I just showed you, is we expanded these models to try and kind of get more deep into that kind of the, the who and the why. So in this particular anomaly example, the primary operator is providing service to a national customer, uh, but there was some internal problem connected to another node, which produced an anomaly that was noticed by the, the software center company. And in this case, it wasn't really clear how the service was actually affected here. So there's still some uncertainty and some known elements in this model. But this helps us sort of draw out, you know, who's involved and what do they depend on and how they're potentially affected. And another example here. Um, so here, the primary operator uh, wanted to take actions to improve his service. And because of this, they made a change and it, uh, it impacts the quality of the service for the customer in a negative way. Uh, so they made some changes uh, some sort of outside of the technology that the, the customer is really caring about, but, but they noticed it when they were doing their data anomaly analysis. And so in the end, the primary operator actually rolled back the changes because it, it had a, a detrimental effect. But of course, it's, it's important for the, the software center company to understand this, to know whether, you know, is this our technology or is it something that you did? Do we have to fix something? Uh, so it's really important to know the, the root problem for why this happened. And these models are kind of working towards that. And so we can use sort of some of the examples that we went through to come up with a taxonomy of anomalies. And you can actually do this in several dimensions. So now that we've collected some interesting attributes for these anomalies, 
you could use any of these attributes to come up with a taxonomy. So you could have like you can uh, have a hierarchy of, of anomalies by events, by end users, by primary operators, by locations. So you can use these to cluster and to kind of filter anomalies. Uh, but I think that all this is interesting and potentially helpful. The ultimate goal is to try and group these anomalies by root cause. And that's the, the kind of difficult part because it's not always incredibly clear what the root cause is. And this is something that the machine learning algorithms don't really tell us. So we made some, some initial progress trying to think about how to group these anomalies by root causes. So here are some, some examples that we've covered so far. So in some cases, there was problems in a fiber optic cable, some sort of infrastructure problem. And another uh, case, like I showed you, the primary operator upgraded and replaced service, and it made a difference. Uh, and in another case, they actually don't know why the anomaly occurred. There's, they're holding a workshop to determine. And in another case, there's sort of problems to connecting to another internal node. And then another case, there's some changes made in another part of the network, which uh, which caused this anomaly. So you can start to classify these into kind of some higher level classifications, like it could be a primary operator issue or the, the software center company issue. It could be a problem in the infrastructure. It could be a problem with upgrading, replacing, or chasing something, changing. It could be an, an internal or external dependency, or it could be unknown. And I'm not in any way saying that this list is complete. I don't think it is. But these are the sort of examples that we've seen so far. And of course, an anomaly could fall into multiple categories. So here's just uh, said. So you have anomaly root cause. It could be company or primary operator issue. It could be unknown. It could be hardware software. It could be some sort of upgrade or change, internal or external dependency. And then if we map out the uh, example anomalies we went through, we can link them to one or more different category to, to try and kind of uh, put them at the leaf level of the taxonomy. So I think this is a good start, but like I said, this is uh, very incomplete, and I think this is something that we need to work on more to see if these are the right categories and uh, you know what other categories are needed depending on the data we find. So we could also have you know overload, degradation of performance, weather events. These are some other categories that could potentially fit into this taxonomy. So I won't read through this, obviously, as a wall of text, but we also have a, a data modeling methodology. So what we've done is we kind of tried to abstract away from our experience in making these models in order to say, OK, if you wanted to do this for your team or your company, uh, and of course, we'd be willing to you know, work with you and, and uh, help you. But if you wanted to theoretically do this on your own, here are some of the steps you'd go through. So you start with these general models that I presented. And then for the goal model, here's some you know, uh, helpful text, hopefully, to uh, help you identify actors and stakeholders, qualities, tasks, resources, links across actors, and then you know, to iterate if, if the previous model is not sufficient for capturing the anomaly. So here's just some guidelines about how to apply those, those steps to make those types of model. And then similar guidelines for the class diagram. So you start with the meta model and then you, you know, look at the entities, the relationships, the attributes, and try and customize them for your particular example reflect on you know, how well this captures the anomaly and perhaps update the, the meta model as needed. So uh, what we're doing right now is we have a potential uh, ma now master student who is going to try and, and take this word world, work forward by implementing a database. So I think what we've done so far has been you know, kind of useful and interesting. Uh, but even though these models are interesting, I mean, it's not really feasible to draw a model by hand for every single anomaly that you find. So what we really want to do is, you know, focus on some more examples, maybe cover, you know, something like a dozen or two dozen anomalies to make sure that these the meta information is sufficient and then work toward automatically uh, fulfilling these or grabbing uh, and filling in this meta meta information into a database so that we have a database of anomaly meta information that can then be searched and analyzed. Uh, and so we've looked through it and we think that some of this information can be gathered uh, automatically through scripts, but some of this information is going to have to be entered by hand. So, for example, information on, you know, what is the root cause? It's hard to gather that automatically. And so the master student is going to kind of gather as much information automatically as they can, populate the database and then indicate what sort of fields are missing and, and sort of prompt the experts to fill it in. So this is going to be easier than actually physically drawing a model for, for each of these anomalies. And then perhaps once we have these informations, we could actually automatically draw these models, uh, which could make it easier to see in a more visual way. And of course, we're also very interested in extending and adapting this to further groups. So I, I think we have plans in the winter or spring, as you call it, to uh, 
to do this with some further groups in Ericsson. And of course, we're interested in applying these to other countries or countries, companies as well within the software center. So I think it would be really interesting to see how much those uh, sort of general models change between companies. I would certainly expect them to change somewhat, but can we come up with a general data anomaly model across companies? Or are, are each company's uh, data anomalies too specific such that we need uh, very customized uh, models? In which case the methodology there could also be quite useful, but uh, it's interesting to see how much this would differ across different software center companies. And so this was what we're working on now. So sort of further validating and expanding the model and trying to implement it and automate it as much as possible in one particular group. Uh, and before I end, I just want to say that although this, this particular presentation wasn't so much about machine learning, I am also working on another project that is more about machine learning. So I'm very interested in non-functional requirements for machine learning, as you can imagine as a requirements engineer. So things like efficiency, accuracy, trust, privacy, fairness, transparency. And if you've seen any machine learning seminars recently, I think you've, you've had, heard a lot of these, these sorts of terms come up. So we're very curious to talk to you about your experiences and we're looking for volunteers for 20 to 30 minute interviews about your perceptions and experience for, with uh, non-functional requirements or qualities for machine learning. And of course, this is anonymous and we're, we're happy to share the eventual results. So if this sounds like anything that's interesting to you, uh, please just send me an email at genho at chalmers.se or send me a message or contact me, whatever other way you prefer. So I ended up uh, being pretty fast, which is sort of good and bad. So that leaves us quite a lot of time for uh, discussions and questions. So I'm happy to take your questions.